JP McCoy has had an unparalleled career. For many, he's the greatest jockey in National Hunt history, and here on ATR, we've been with him for many of those highs and lows. Over the next half hour, we reflect on some of his great memories, starting with the day he reached 3,000 winners at Plumpton. Two fences left to jump. Restless Dante is inside. On the outside, it's the package. They settle down to battle it out. The package this side. Restless Dante, the far side. One more fence left to jump. The package this side, Timmy Murphy. Tournament going going for the 3,000 on Restless Dante. Here they jump the last. In the air together. Restless Dante on the far side. The package this side. Can Tony McCoy get it? Here he comes. He's coming towards the line. It's 3,000 for AP McCoy. Well done, Tony McCoy. What a jockey. It couldn't be wetter, it couldn't be worse, it couldn't be colder. He's absolutely starving to bits. And he could go and ride horses like that and ride finishes like that. Can you ever imagine maybe three and a half, four thousand winners? Every day. It's so stupid, but you have to dream or you have to have, you know, you have to believe that you can achieve them things, otherwise there's no point going out. And I spend most of my life dreaming, so uh, I keep dreaming. Since his link with J.P. McManus, we've been fortunate to see A.P. in action many times in Ireland, where we've seen him winning aboard a whole host of top-class horses. Mark's falls on the rise just in the lead. Max Joy, Brave Inca, Republican almost down at the last. They're inside the last 200 yards. Mark's fall with Brave Inca, putting it in from edges right the inside. Brave Inca wins the game of champion hurdle for Tony McCoy in a tremendous finish. The final fence four in line. Butler's Cabin, Linda Savannah towards the inside. American Jenny and Church Island, but running up towards the finish. Butler's Cabin and Tony McCoy won the Powers National for JP McManus and Joe Journey. Synchronized now, the Welsh Grand National winner and Tony McCoy are striding away to win the Lexus in great style for JP McManus and John O'Neill. It's synchronized, it's clear. Carlingford Lock and Tony McCoy coming there. They're racing up towards the finish, and it's going to be a JP McManus winner. Carlingford Lock and Tony McCoy will give JP his sixth Galway plate win. More on Carlingford Lock later, but perhaps the most famous day in ATR's history came on the 7th of November 2013 as AP headed to Toaster on 3,999 winners with two chances of reaching the 4,000 landmark. We first caught up with him over breakfast. Uh, hopefully. Uh, hopefully it'll be today, the sooner the better, because for lots of reasons, obviously for the, the expense that my wife is going to to keep herself looking glamorous and um, uh, hopefully it'll be today I've got a couple of chances so hopefully it'll be nice if one of them won you know. and here's the man we've all come to see today AP McCoy the green and yellow hoops white cap the famous colors of JP McManus JP delighted to say here at Toaster as well to hopefully witness a little bit of history Second and final chance today to land the 4,000 winners on Mountain Tunes number six. And they're off and racing. Pride of the castle up the inside. He's in pole position to try and wind up this sedate early pace. Premier Portraits on the outside between them, Hurricane Ivan. They're followed by Scuderia and Chris Spin, and then Mountain Tunes on the outside. Mountain Tunes landed about three lengths off the pace, no more than that. Panama Petrus round the outside, and then Scuderi, who's lost ground, really tightly bunched up here on the turn for home. And now Pride of the Castle's been headed. It's Chris Spin who goes for home here. On the outside, Panama Petrus, and these two have quickened up together with Premier Portrait, and McCoy on Mountain Tunes sees himself now four lengths off the leaders. They head then to the closing stages. Pride of the Castle's weakened very tamely, heading then towards the second last. Panama Petrus comes through together with Chris Spin on the far side. An untidy jump from Tony McCoy and Mountain Tunes. He's five legs back in third place, but he's not given up though as they head towards the final flight. Chris Spin is out in front here. Chris Spin from Panama Petrus. Mountain Tunes still staying on. Surely he can't, can he? The final flight there. An untidy jump, Chris Spin and Mountain Tunes and Tony McCoy.
it's amazing, you know, it couldn't have worked any better. Um, obviously for, for John Joe and, and, and for obviously for JP and, and Noreen and the managers have been so good to me. Um, you had to do it that way, AP, didn't you? You had yeah, to do it the different you know, look, way. Look, it was always, it was always going to be hopefully that I could, I could ride it in JP's colours because Eve, Eve. It's just poetry, absolutely, now that he's won today. The weather, you know, toaster, amazing, like hospitality. The crowds here are phenomenal. Typically, you had to do um, it the difficult way. Oh, my you? God, we, we, we all were just, our hearts were like absolutely in our mouth. I kind of had nearly given up. But anyway, it was, a, it was a typical AP ride, definitely. What a man, what a ride there. Yeah. You know, but uh, I think when he came in, he was more pleased. He said, I think that's a nice horse. He said. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that ride does just sum him up, really, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, uh, to the real theatre stuff. He, he's a credit to the game. To anybody he deals with, it's a pleasure to have him around. And every day with him is the most enjoyable day. The way the horse won, uh, the fact that uh, lots of people had seem to take the day off and come to Toaster in, in the anticipation that um, I was hopefully or definitely going to ride a winner, which um, on my way in when I saw lots of press and people there, I was thinking um, if it was if this game was only as easy as people think. Um, but it was fantastic, you know, uh, obviously riding uh, the winner for, for John Joe and, and, and for JP. Um, those colours, Chanel and Archie and Eve were there. My dad and my brother were there. Um, but uh, look, I, I've been lucky all throughout my life. Look, so um, you know, for the people that first and foremost for the people that I worked with, you know, from the late Billy Rock, um, I had four and a half years in Jim Bolger's. Um, I I was so lucky to come and work for Toby Balding um, when I when I came to England in England first. Um, I spent seven and a half years with Martin Pipe, um, which was would have been any jockey's dream to be able to to ride for Martin Pipe for seven and a half days, never mind seven and a half years. Um, and we, we become great friends. Um, and, and then obviously for, for, for John Joe and, and, and for the boss. Um, so it's been fantastic in, in every way. I've, I've you know, worked, ridden lots of winners for different people. You know, we were just sent away in the late David Johnson when I was at Martin's. I, I rode so many winners um, for, for David as well. Um, so. You know, I, I've, I've been lucky, and yesterday was a special day in lots of ways because my agent, Dave Roberts, who's booked me on all 4,000 winners, I should think. Um, sadly, his father passed away the day before yesterday, and um, he, he came racing, and uh, you know, he, he said his, his dad would have wanted him to come. So I, I, I felt in, in, in lots of ways that um, maybe his dad was looking down on me, you know. Over the next 15 months, the racing world were guessing if AP would go for 5,000 winners or retire. After his dream of 300 winners in a season was shattered following a horror fall at Worcester, he announced that his 20th jockey's title would be his last. In typical McCoy style, just 24 hours after his announcement, he landed the Irish Hennessy for the first time amid wonderful scenes at Leopardstown. Mike Flag is raised. Nero. On his own, he's now taken up the knees of the Lord Windermere, followed by Fox Rock and Carlingford Lock. And it's on his own, pushed along in front. Lord Windermere is now out after him on the inside. And then comes Home Farm, being followed by Carlingford Lock, who's trying to get into it. First lieutenant gives way, and then comes Fox Rock over the second last. And Lord Windermere jumps a place to head of on his own, who's come under pressure. Fox Rock is moved into third. Then Carlingford Lock, first lieutenant, Home Farm, Texas Jack and Boston Bob. But rounding the home turn, one fence left to jump in the Hennessy goal. Cup, and as they straighten up for the last, it's Lord Windermere and Davy Russell in the lead. From Fox Rock and Adrian Heskin making ground in the centre. On his own, Ruby Watch on the near side. Carlingford Lock joins in for Tony McCoy, then Texas Jack Paul Carberry. And Fox Rock jumps to the front on the run in. Carlingford Lock is trying down a strong challenge on the far side. And then Lord Windermere, they're racing now inside the final 150 yards. Carlingford Lock on the inside of Fox Rock. They're running up towards the line. Garlic for love, Tony McCoy has got him in the hands, he got him up before he retires. Can't fight fate, and that's just what they say, you know, I think it was obviously meant to be the way things happened. Um, a fair play to John Kiley, like he's, every day I've wanted this horse, he's produced the goods like, so 
amazing, like all the people in that town here today, like you know, um, I have to be careful, I don't be too emotional because it's not good for the image, is it? So ladies and gentlemen, parading in front of the stands is the 2015 winner of the Hennessy Gold Cup, number two, Carlingford Lock, and Tony McCoy, the one race that eluded him, well he's just won it. The day after the Hennessy, AP took time to reflect on his decision to retire with ATR's Luke Harvey. It was a decision, Luke, that I felt that had to be made. Um, it was something that I obviously hadn't taken lightly. Um, when I was first asked about it the other day, when I'd first thought about it, I, I said five years ago. And, and in some ways, and I was joking, and in other ways, I wasn't, because five years ago, I did think, you know, I felt good. I felt that, you know, I could try and hopefully win another five jockey championships. And if that got me to 20, it would be a great number. And I brought up in conversation uh, with JP at the end of April last year after Jetski won in Punchestown. Um, and I just happened to mention it to him that, you know, it's possible that it could be my last year, see how, and obviously JP was being JP, uh, great with his words of wisdom, you know, was, you know, see how you feel and see how things go. And, and that was very much always the plan. I was lucky that I had such a great start to the season Oh, my fastest 50th winner, my fastest 100th winner, my fastest 150th winner. And genuinely believed I was going to ride 300 winners. And I thought the more that I got, the more winners I was riding, the more I actually thought it would be an even better way to retire. Um, sadly, I got injured at Worcester and that put an end to all that. I always had the fear, look, about carrying on too long. I always had the fear that if I left it until after Cheltenham or after, Liverpool that there would be speculation from people that who would be well aware that it was possibly going to be my 20th year being champion jockey and there might be speculation that I, I might retire, I might not retire and I, I didn't want to be reading about the speculation, I didn't want to be having people speculating about my career, I wanted it to be on my terms and when, when I spoke to JP and to, to Dave Roberts about the decision about announcing it when I rode my 200th winner it was purely because it was something that I felt was an achievement and it was something that obviously Dave, uh, I and, 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 and JP had felt that, you know, normally you would retire and just be done with it, but, we, you know, I, I've kind of felt, and the three of us kind of felt that it was best to, to maybe, you know, let people know that I was retiring and, and ride for a couple of months and um, enjoy what's left of my riding career, if you like. I have never in my life ever thought I was the best jockey. I've, I've always been very confident when I go out in a race to think that I can, I, I can win on any horse that I go out on. Um, I've never had the ego to think that, you know, that the, the brilliant jockeys that there's been in Ireland and England before me, you know, people like, you know, if you go back as far as John, Joe, Peter Scudimore, John Frankham, Richard and Woody in my time, and then in Ireland you'd obviously, you know, people like, I mean, JP said Tommy Carey was a brilliant rider. Mm. Frank Berry was 10 times champion jockey. Charlie Swan was a multiple champion jockey. You know, I, and, and then in recent times, you've obviously had Ruby and Barry and Dickie Johnson. I, I never in my life ever thought that I was better than any of those people, you know. And, but at the same time, when I go out on a horse, I'm fairly happy that I can compete. And I think that I'm every bit as good as, as, no what, one as what they are, you know. There's no one even stepping your is there? Yeah, look, in terms of numbers, there's, numerically, there's probably not, you know, but, um, you know, you need to, look, uh, as I said, I, I wanted to go out while I was still enjoying it. I wanted to go out while I was still riding well. I said the other, the other day that I wanted people to, to be asking why I was retiring and not why I wasn't retiring. You know, I, I wanted it to be, you know, I wanted it to be go, go before people thought that I should go, you know. So I wanted it to be, look, there wasn't, I wouldn't say there was an element of surprise, but there was probably an element of surprise when I announced it on Saturday. And, mm -hmm. and I, and I kind of wanted it to be that way, you know. I, I didn't want it, it to be dragging out and, you know, and, and, and as I said, I wanted it to be on my terms and I, and I wanted it, uh, you know, I wanted to, to, to feel happy and proud about it, you know. I probably know as well as, as well as anybody and I think the body blow is that 300. You had that, you were single-minded about that, weren't you? Yeah, look, I, I don't mind admitting that that, emotionally broke me I think you know um, because I when I started at the beginning of this season you know I was you know well aware that 
obviously Jason was injured. I was riding. I was going to be riding a lot for Donald. I've been lucky to ride for for Donald. When Jason was off, John Joe's horse were flying, and I, I I had it in my mind, like I've always had. You know, it's not something I'd ever talk about, but I was going to go out. If it was going to be in the last year, I was going to go out and give it my best. And I had an unbelievably good start. Rode, as I said, rode them fast as 50, fast as 150. And then when I got the fall that day in Worcester. Um, I was there. That was sickening. Yeah. It, it, it kind of, look, the, the pain wasn't, the pain, the pain of not being able to get up and the pain of not being able to, to go back riding when I wanted to, to go back riding was, would far outweigh the physical pain. You know, it was more than the mental and emotional pain that um, that something that I thought for 20 years that I hadn't been able to achieve. I thought it was that close, and I, I genuinely thought I'd be able to do it. And um, you know, got the fall, and you know, went and had X-rays, and I, I punctured my lung and dislocated my collarbone and broke a couple of ribs, as I said. And, you know, and then I went back riding after three days. You know, and, and it, look, I wasn't being brave about anything. I was able to do press ups and do the whole lot. I mean doctors pushing on my shoulder and my collarbone and you know just sort of smiling it on it didn't hurt and um, went back riding and got a and I managed to get a fall again not long later and managed to break the same collarbone that I dislocated so that was the end and probably for those three weeks while I was at home I was I was broken I, when I started when I came in and first Richard and he was champion jockey he was the best jockey that I'd, I'd ever seen you know he was the hardest man that I'd ever seen I learned so much from looking at Richard and Woody, both good and bad. You know, he, I'm a very selfish, obsessive, self-centered person, probably not in the same league as him. Um, he wanted to do everything for himself. He wanted to ring trainers. He wanted to get on the best horse all the time. He wanted to dri drive himself to the races. He wanted to book all his flights. He wanted, you know, wanted to do everything himself. And, and it wasn't being clever, but I kind of felt that if I wanted to have a longevity, I couldn't live a life like that and carry, and do it for a long period of time. There would come a time when going to Catrick today or going to Air tomorrow was going to be a, a bit of a drag and thinking, I don't really want to do that. And, and at that early stage of my life, I, I wanted to get a structure that would make it as easy as possible, make it that all that was important to me was riding horses, that it, nothing was going to get in my way. I just had to turn up at the races, as my friend David Manassi in there would say, you do five minutes work five or six times a day. So in total, you do half an hour's work every day. <laughs> and you get back in the car and you go to sleep and you go home. But I, I wanted that my, my life to be like that. You know, I wanted it to be, the only importance it was to me was to be winning. The AP farewell tour took him around the UK and Ireland. And he said goodbye to his Irish racing fans at Ferry House over Easter with a grade one win aboard Gil Gumboa in the Ryanair Gold Cup before saying his final farewells to his adoring public. At the last, nothing between the three, and away from it, Gil Gamboa on the near side of smashing as they run up towards the finish. Gil Gamboa and Tony McCoy in the J.P. McManus colours is going to win for Enda Bulger. As a proud Irish man, it's, um, it's nice to come back here and, and, and obviously a bit sad that it was my final day. Um, the Irish people have been very good, like all racing people are, you know, there were great, great receptions any day that I've been lucky enough to ride a winner here, they've been very good and they're real, real racing people and um, I'm going to miss places like, like, like this, just that's for sure, you know. Over the last 10 years, we've been privileged to have wonderful moments on and off the track, courtesy of AP McCoy. AP gets serious, AP in full flight, no move to be denied, Synchronise sticks his neck out, and AP and Synchronise win the job for Midland Grand National. So the impulse begins to paddle, he needs the line, here comes Three Kingdoms, bearing down on the outside, McCoy and Walsh, McCoy wins! I promise you, Ted is much more fashionable. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, oh, do you know what? I'm getting more and more like my dad every day. And I said, your dad's way more pleasant than you are. 50 yards left in the classic, and the one on the near side, and he's firing it. No point, it's got up to beat the podium. Any jockey who thinks they're going to go out and have a nice time, have a nice life, not end up in the back of an ambulance, they shouldn't be riding. And, and if they do think that, they're never any good anyway. Captain CB has put all his problems behind him, and there's the real Captain CB to win for Eddie Hardy and J.P. McManus and Tony McCoy. I, I did think that the radio said you better than you think that they'd have been in front of the television. <laughs> You're not the only one. <laughs> Roast
in there. It's a tremendous finish to the fight. Finger on the post. Great man to work for, and, and very knowledgeable. He's a very good race rider. Mountain Tunes and Tony McCoy now launching a tremendous attack on the outside. 